Hey folks, and welcome to Tweak Week. I've got six different videos to take you through this week, starting with the Burson Audio V7 op amps, that's the brand new range, both the classic and the vivid versions of those. And then moving through some slightly more contentious tweaks perhaps, including things like audiophile fuses, speaker cables, USB cables, RCA cables, and power cables. I've got all that to cover over the coming week. So I hope you're going to enjoy this series of videos with me. I know some of these topics are going to get some of you riled up. That's not my intention. I'm just a fellow audiophile and enthusiast exploring this hobby for myself. I'll talk to you about each of the other products in their videos and my expectations or lack of expectations going into each test. But for today, we're going to jump straight in to the Burson Audio V7 op amps. By the way, if you want to catch those other videos, make sure you subscribe and ring the notification bell so you don't miss out. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. As I mentioned, today's video is going to be focused on the V7 op amp range. That's these guys here from Burson Audio. Thank you to them for sending out a set of both the classics and the vivids. I'll explain the differences between them as we listen to them. But for those not familiar with op amps like these, the idea is that some amplifiers and DACs will allow you to swap out these chips. And so these chips can either be a really tiny 8-pin kind of integrated black silicon chip, or they can be something a little bit more elaborate like the Burson's or the Sparco's Labs. And the idea is that if you have a DAC or a headphone amp or any other device with a swappable op amp, then theoretically, as long as you get the matching of the right models correct, you can pop out the old one, pop in one of these or some of the others on the market like the Sparkos, and then enjoy a different quality of sound, sometimes a better quality of sound as a result. Now I've done a big roundup of op amps once before using the previous V6 Vivid and Classic, also the Staccato op amps and the Sparkos Labs regular range of op amps. I haven't yet done rolling with the pro grade Sparkos Labs op amps, that might be for a future video. And so today the way we're going to check out the V7s is taking a listen to them in the Gishelli Labs J2S AK4499 version DAC. And so that's going to be a comparison between the Sparkos Labs op amps that come in the J2S if you choose to order it with them, that's an upgrade option and also with the V7s. I've then also got the Burson Solowus 3XP on hand, and that's going to be a comparison for us between the previous V6 op amps and the new V7s. For those of you that want to know how the Solowus 3XGT with the V7s compares to something like the Voyager that comes with the V7s, and that's going to all be covered in my review of the Voyager itself. So make sure again that you subscribe and ring the notification bell. I've got so much good content coming. For now though, let's dive in and try the Gishelli Labs J2S that's up on the Burson mothership behind me here. I'm going to listen to that with the Sparkos, then swap over to the Bursons and see what I hear and share that with you. All right, I'm back and feeling a little bit like a mad scientist here. I've just gone through so many different op-amp rolls in a number of different devices. I had the J2S AK4499 DAC up here at one stage. I've now got behind me the Solowus 3XP and the Composer 3XP, both from Burson Lab, Burson Audio, I should say. And I've done a lot of rolling. So what I've tried here, I'll just show you all the options. We've got the Sparkos Labs 33602. I'll see if I can get a focus on that one. All right, so that's the Sparkos Labs SS3602. We've also got, and this is just for size and, and models, we've also got the V6 Vivid from Burson Audio, that one there. I'll just turn it around so you can see the label. So that's the, that's the old generation V6. And then the new ones that we've got, which are currently installed, so I'm not going to pull those out. Let me grab a I told you I was like a mad scientist at the moment. So what we've got in terms of the um, V7s, if I can find a box that's got some in it still, as you can see, these series of videos are going to be a little bit less produced than usual. Hopefully you enjoy sort of the, the more natural behind the scenes version. This isn't going to be the new standard for videos. Everything's falling out of the box. So that is the look of the new V7. Sorry, let me get it in front of my face so you can see it. So the V7s now look like this. They've got a little trim pot on the side that I'm not yet sure what it's for. Come on, camera focus. You can do it. You can do it. There we go. So we've got the V7 Classic is the, the sort of rose gold copper looking one. And then the red version of the anodized metal is the Vivid. A couple of things to note about these. When you buy them... In addition to the op amps, what you also get in the packet is a couple of little dip eight spaces. If I hold it back here, it can focus. So the dip eight spaces, that's going to allow you to basically either raise the op amp if you need to by a small amount. It also means though that you can kind of protect the pins of the op amp. Use this like a socket saver on a tube if you want to. So you get that. You also get a 
couple of little rubber bands. So those are going to wrap around the bottom of the little socket saver there, the dip eight um, adapter. And then you can put this over the top of the op amp. Let me do one so you can see what I mean. So if you take the op amp itself, make sure you line it up the right way. I have just cooked one of the op amps, one of the Sparkos Labs accidentally. I cooked, so do be careful about that. There is voltage, reverse voltage protection built into the Bursons, but I don't know if that's going to protect them from being inserted the wrong way or just if they're inserted into an amp that's not compatible. I'm not sure exactly how much protection that gives you, but it is nice to know there is some protection built into the circuit. So the idea is if you put these little socket savers on, and one nice thing is the pins are really tight on these. They feel really solid and secure. So you can put that on. And then if you put a little rubber band around it, it's just going to help to hold the op amp in place like so. You can probably just see the rubber band around there now. I'm not going to do a whole lot of glamour video B-roll for this um, set of tweaking videos. There's not a lot to show you. So it's going to be mostly me talking and sharing stuff with you here on, on camera. Let's get to what you really want to know though, and that's how they sound. Having gone through a bunch of rolling, let me just quickly check my notes and I'll share with you what I've heard. I've just posted this to channel patrons, so they've got behind the scenes access as I'm recording this on the 1st of March. They've been able to see my, my listening notes here. I'm just going to tell you what I've, what I've shared with them uh, and elaborate a little bit as well. So the first test I did was I took the Sparkos Labs, this is the J2S, um, so the J2 socketed version of the Sparkos, so start again, the Gishelli Labs DAC, the J2S, and that allows you to put different op amps in there whilst also using the AK4499 and the AK4191 combo DAC chips. The starting setup that I had in this was the Sparkos because that's what it comes with if you spec it up. And what I heard going from the Sparkos, first of all, to the V7 Classics, which are meant to be a little bit more colored, a bit smoother, a bit warmer. And that's pretty much exactly what I heard. The, the V7 Classics have a bit of extra weight and richness in their sound. They're not a boomy or bassy type of op amp. The weight that you hear is more in the lower mids and the upper bass. So it just gives a bit of heft to the mid range, a bit more emphasis to vocals rather than the treble and the bass. It doesn't roll off the treble and the bass. It just puts more emphasis in the mids. And I really like it. It's a very enjoyable, what some might consider a more analog and vinyl type sound. I'm not saying it necessarily makes it sound like vinyl, but people often describe that sort of sound as a bit more analog. So that's why I'm using that term. And the, the gist of it for me is that I think it makes it a slightly more laid back and slightly more relaxed sound, but that doesn't mean it's lacking detail. What was really interesting was that the Sparkos Labs didn't have as much nuance in the sound and as much sense of transparency as the slightly thicker and richer sounding classics did. And in fact, using the term thicker is probably not fair on the classics because they're delivering more, as I said, nuance, more transparency. I can hear more details in the music, but it's not pushing it at you because of that lovely, richer sound that it's got. On first listen, because there is probably more balance across the board with the Sparkos between treble, mid-range, and bass, you're probably going to initially think the Sparkos are actually giving you more transparency and more resolution. But as you listen more, or as I listened more, I found that it was actually the classics I was hearing little nuances in the sound that I wasn't getting as much from the Sparkos. So they're not going to give you the same, that being the classics, are not going to give you the same sense of energy in the top end, the sense of sparkle in the treble. And that may come across initially as a lacking detail, but they're really not. They're just delivering probably a little bit more detail and a bit more transparency with a slightly more laid back presentation, if that makes sense. The other thing that really separates these for me, and, and this surprised me because the Sparkos for quite some time have been my kind of go-to favorite op amp over and above the V6 Vivids and the V6 Classics. There are times that I really liked the V6 Vivids and Classics, but the Sparkos were the one that I most often reached for. Now though, that's flipping the other way. I think the V7s have taken a jump above the Sparkos for me. And the thing that really sets them apart in the case of the classics is the sense of space they deliver. They're giving me much more sense of depth in the soundstage. They're also giving me a little bit better sense of the separation between instruments because there is more overall space to work with. And I really enjoy their presentation. In a DAC like the J2S, I really enjoy the sound of the V7 classics. I probably slightly prefer the V7 Vivids, as I'll tell you in a second, but if you want that slightly more kind of mid-range, sort of easy to listen to, more laid back, slightly romantic sound, call it what you will, I think that's where possibly the V7s actually might have a slight edge. So the V7 Classics might actually have a bit of an edge. So really impressed with what they're doing there. Let me check my notes, see if there's anything else I need to tell you. 
Yeah, so the final thing I had in my notes is that I did slightly prefer the overall tonality of the Sparkos. So that balance between the bass, the mid-range and the treble, I think is more natural and neutral from the Sparkos. But the sense of space, the sense of separation and imaging, all of that I actually prefer. And the nuance and transparency, I do prefer that from the V7 Classic. So I think if you gave me both the Sparkos or the V7 Classics, I would choose the Classics, despite the fact that they are a bit less neutral. And so that then means we need to compare the V7 Classics and the V7 Vivids to see which of those is my favourite and also which sorts of devices each one suits. And that's where I pulled out the Soloist 3XP and the Composer 3XP to roll through and see how they perform in different circuits. And something I should mention here, with op amps and op amp rolling, the character of the op amp doesn't change. So what I've just described from the Classics, that's going to be true whether you're putting it in a DAC or an amp, whether it's a Gishelli DAC, a, a Burson DAC, a Burson amp, a Gishelli amp, if there are any with rollable op amps, um, if it's a some of the Shanling gear lets you roll op amps, any of the other brands as well that let you roll op amps, what I've just described is going to be consistent from the op amp. So the trick in choosing the right op amp for you is not which op amp do I need for this DAC or this amp, which one synergizes best, it's actually a personal question. It's not that someone can say, oh, in that particular product, you have to have this particular op amp. What it's about doing is having a listen to the device you have in its current state and deciding what you want more of or less of. So in other words, in a, an amplifier like the Solowus 3XP, which I'll talk about in more detail in a second, that to me, the natural kind of bass starting sound of the Solowus 3XP benefits from a little dash of the Classic's warmth and richness. And that's not to say that the Classic is the best op amp for the soloist. It's just that for me, that's the combination that I like the most. The starting tonality of the 3XP does have a slight bit of extra energy in the treble that I don't always enjoy, a slight tonality in the treble that I'm not always a fan of, and that's where the Classics help detain that a little bit. In much the same way that I used to really like the Sparkos Labs um, op amps in the volume stage, of the 3XP just to help tone that treble down a little bit. Running it with two of the V6 Vivids as it comes with was just a bit too much in the treble emphasis for me. My point here is I'm not going to be able to answer for you which op amp you should put into each different device. What I can tell you is how each op amp sounds, what its character is, and then you need to decide which character of op amp you think is going to best suit the device you have. And so with that in mind, let's talk now about the V7 Vivid up against the V7 Classic because these have a lot of the same technology going on in them, but they do sound a bit different. And basically the way I'd sum it up is that the V7 Vivid is the neutral sounding op amp. It's the one that is gonna be completely transparent, completely neutral. It's not gonna color the sound at all. And that means that you do get a greater sense of resolution and clarity from it compared to the classics. In other words, this is gonna give you the same tonality as something like a Sparkos Labs op amp. On the other hand, what it's also going to do, though, is give you some of the space, some of the transparency and the nuance that I was getting from the classic. But interestingly, the way this presents the sound, because it hasn't got that slightly richer mid-range, somewhere in there, I felt like also the sound came a little bit closer to me as a listener. So you're not getting quite the same sense of depth in the soundstage from the Vivid as you do from the Classic, but it's a very subtle difference. Both of these are still more spacious sounding than the Sparkos, and I have a theory as to why that's happening. I'm wondering if it's to do with the speed of these op amps and or how much feedback they're using. That's a conversation I'd have to have with the engineers over at Burson to see if I can find out more, and I might do that one if I can. But the takeaway for me is that if you're looking for a more neutral sound, I think the V7 Vivid is definitely the choice over the Classic. The good news is the V7 Vivid, in my opinion, is still better than the Sparkos, and that's a big statement. The Sparkos are brilliant. I think the V7 Vivid from Burson is more brilliant. And one of the key things that I know some of you will be wanting to know is that with the old V6 Vivids here, they had a slightly kind of metallic timbre to their, to their treble in particular, to their sound overall. And one of the concerns was whether or not the V7 Vivid carried that through. And on my first listen, I was a bit worried that the V7 Vivid might have still had a bit of treble emphasis, maybe a slightly V-shaped sound or a slightly J-shaped shaped sound even. The good news is that when I compared the V7 Vivids to the Sparkos, the tonality was identical. I couldn't tell that there was any change in the treble tonality or the treble quantity, I probably should say. 
And the good news is that all that metallic kind of timbral quality of the sound is gone with the V7 Vivids. So they're a big step up in my opinion from the V6 Vivids and therefore definitely worth the investment if you've been on the fence about them. And so to bring all this to a close from a sonic point of view, and then there's just a couple of little tiny things I'll tell you about these to wrap things up. The things I would say to bring this to a, a sonic close at least is that I think both the V7 Vivid and Classic, or Vivid and Classic, are fantastic. I think they're a really big step forward in the op-amp design from the V6s, which were already great, and now over and above the Sparkos Labs as well, that being the standard Sparkos Labs, I don't have a device where I can compare, and I don't have the op-amps on hand to compare the pro Sparkos Labs op-amps just yet. Hopefully I'll get a chance to do that in the future. But for now what I'd say is that these are the best op-amps that I have heard. And the key thing for me then comes down to, as I said before, what sort of character you want for your particular device. So for those of you that want to maintain the stock tonal character of whatever your device is now, that's where probably the V7 Vivid is the best choice. For those of you though that are finding your current device with its current sound is a little bit too bright, a bit too energetic in the treble potentially, or maybe you just want a slightly more laid back sound overall, that's where I think the V7 Classic is a great choice. And so for me, just to give a bit of context there, in something like the Soloist 3XP, that's where I would blend the V7 Vivid in the gain stage, and I'd put a pair of V7 Classics in the uh, volume stage. That to me gives a nice balance of the smoothness that I think the base 3XP design needs. That's where the Sparkos used to be great. And therefore, I think the combination of both is my ideal for the 3XP. On the other hand, if you go to something like the Composer, which is also a 3XP, so sorry, I was talking about the Soloist first, the Amplifier, now talking about the Composer DAC. Talking about the Composer, I actually would just go the Vivids all the way. I don't think the Composer had that tonal problem that I feel like the Soloist 3XP does, just a little tiny bit. It's not a big deal, but it's just enough that the little bit of dash of warmth from the Classics in the volume stage really helps the amp. The DAC doesn't need it, and therefore it's the Vivids all the way. Now I'm throwing around lots of different terms here, so I hope I haven't left anyone behind. The takeaway for me is keep with the V7 Vivids if you're not looking for tonal change, if you want to warm things up but still have what I think is probably one of the best technical performing op amps on the market, then that's where the V7 Classic comes into play. And as I said before, if you want to know specifically how these perform in the Soloist 3X GT up against the Voyager, and indeed if you want to know how the Voyager sounds with a set of classics in it, then I'll cover all of that off in the Voyager review. So again, subscribe and ring the notification bell if you want to catch that one. But for now, the couple of last things I wanted to tell you about these op amps. I've already mentioned that you need to be careful to insert them the right way around. If you're not familiar with rolling op amps, the way you can tell is that on the little dip eight adapters, here's one here, you will hopefully see the little cutout that's at the top of the chip there. So that cutout is your indicator for which direction the chip needs to go. On the actual circuit board, you'll see that the socket on the circuit board has that cutout, and then each different op amp brand will have its own way of identifying which direction the op amp needs to go in. In the case of the Burson V7s, and indeed the V6s did this too, there is actually a groove down the side of the op amp that will match up with the groove on the circuit board. In the case of something like the Sparkos, the Sparkos have a little gold corner, so you can see the top corner there has a little gold dot on it. That's the end that goes towards the cutout. So you do need to make sure you get that right. If you don't, you let the magic smoke come out of these and then they don't work anymore because they need the magic smoke. So don't insert these the wrong way around. Be very, very careful about that. Otherwise you're gonna cook your op amp and it's quite an expensive mistake. The other thing that I did wanna mention about these op amps, the new range of the V7s, as you can see here, if I hold them at pin level, is much, much shorter than the old V6, which is great. It's gonna fit into more locations now. For example, the Duchelli Labs cases used to not be able to fit these in. If you just put them in normally, you'd have to come up with some kind of fancy adapter. So you can now fit them in more cases. However, they are still bigger than something like the Sparkos by a long margin. So you're not gonna fit these into something like an X-Duo XD05 Pro, which I'm gonna review soon. I can fit the Sparkos in there. There's no chance of fitting these in. Having said that, the voltage requirements of these do mean that they're probably more suited to full-size desktop devices anyway. And so, in a, and so in a full-size desktop device, you should generally have enough space for these. What I mean by a full-size desktop device, if you're running something that takes a little 5-volt USB input, this is probably not a good idea. 
However, if you've got something that runs a proper wall wart putting out, say, 12 volts or 8 volts or whatever it might be, probably you want to stick to 12 volts plus based on the fact that I think these swing 8 volts. You're going to want a more kind of hefty, properly power supplied device. Now, if you're in any doubt, check out the Burson website. You can email Burson as well to ask them where these are going to work, where they're not going to work. But that's just a few tips. One final thing to mention, these are using an aluminium um, outer shell and the aluminium is there as a heat sink. These do get quite hot. I haven't left them run for a long, long time and then tried to grab them. So I don't know how hot they get. But I know from my short testing where I was kind of listing for a few minutes and then turning it off, swapping in and out, these got hot enough that I was aware of it when I touched them. They weren't quite getting sort of tube hot where I couldn't touch it without burning myself after use, but potentially with longer usage and an extended listing time, they could actually get quite warm. So do be aware of that. They're going to be designed to dissipate that heat and keep themselves operating just fine, but it is worth being aware that they do get quite warm and that's what the heat sink's there for. So I think that's everything I can tell you right now about the V7s. As I said, there's going to be more content on the V7s in the Voyager review. And of course, if I've missed anything that you want me to cover off, do let me know down in the comments below. I'll be happy to answer if I can. For now, though, I hope this video has been useful and helpful. If it has, please hit the like button and subscribe and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. And don't forget that for the rest of this week, I've got a video every single day with all different audio tweaks. I hope to see you on those videos as well. For now, though, let me leave it to the music. So happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.